Good morning and welcome to the worship of the Lord. Welcome to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. I'm Andrew Sigenthaler, one of the pastors here. And if you're with us for the first time, or if you've recently been coming to Coral Ridge, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And we hope, we have a hope for you. It's the same hope that we have for ourselves, and that is that you will meet the living God in this hour of worship. If you're sad, we hope the living God comforts you. If you're wandering, we hope he convicts you and brings you home. If you're anxious, we hope he reassures you. And if you're blessed and happy, we hope he humbles you and makes you generous. Well, listen to our call to worship. It's from 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a living hope through the new birth in Jesus Christ. And he has given us an inheritance, an eternal inheritance kept in heaven for us. To him be the praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and sing praise to Christ, our living hope. Destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ. 
Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Worship builds a reservoir of God's truth to draw from when we face difficult moments. I know that every time I choose to worship, it builds my faith in God. It reminds me once again that my God is greater than any storm, and he speaks peace. My prayer is that you, that during these times of fear and uncertainty, that you will find a refuge in the Almighty, declare his promises and sing his praises and know his peace.
Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, guardian of our souls, you have promised to watch over us and keep us from all harm. You have assured us again and again that nothing can separate us from your love. You have proved that all your purposes for us will be accomplished. Yet we worry about our troubles, real and imagined. We turn to created things for the help that you alone can give. We collapse when we should be strong and prove to be poor witnesses for you. Oh Lord, forgive us of our sinful fear and worry. Send your Holy Spirit to enable us to rely on you at all times. And may we remember that you have promised to be with us to the very end of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's remain standing and let's affirm our faith with believers around the world and through the ages with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Mark and Holly Douglas are members of our church, and they are involved in a ministry called Love Life. And this morning, we're going to have a ministry spotlight on this ministry and the way that you can be involved.
everyone can do something. Everyone can do something. It's not right for one pregnancy care center to shoulder the burden. It's not right for one church to shoulder the burden. He's called the body of Christ to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. How will you be remembered? What story will you tell when you get to heaven and you sit around the marriage supper of the Lamb? What will be your testimony that you will give? We have one life to live, church. Let it be about building his kingdom and not ours. Good morning, church. Church, this is our adoption week. This is our week to mobilize as a congregation. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Mark Douglas. My wife Holly and I, we lead the local chapter of Love Life here in South Florida. We're also members of Coral Ridge, and we're so excited to be here with you guys. We're thankful for Pastor Rob and our pastoral team for all their support and uh, encouragement. Uh, since we started last year, we launched last year, March of uh, 2021. And uh, Love Life exists to unite and mobilize the church, to create a culture of love and life that will result in an end to abortion and the orphan crisis. See, we're believing for a shift in culture where we, stop, we see families stop running to local abortion clinics and start running to local churches just like ours and just like Calvary Chapel North Miami. I mentioned Calvary Chapel North Miami because our, ch our team was blessed to be a part of a baby shower for one of the 49 moms that have chosen life at the abortion clinic since we started last year. See, this mom, she showed up to an abortion. Yeah, praise God for that. See, this mom, she showed up to the abortion clinic 22 weeks pregnant, and she met one of our sidewalk missionaries and after about a 45-minute conversation, she went from saying, there's no way that I could have this child to really truly believing that this child is a blessing from God. Since then, she's been plugged in with that local church. They hosted a baby shower with her. They've provided her a mentor. And that mom and her boyfriend and her two other born children are in that church this morning worshiping Jesus. See, I share that story because stories like that and many others do not exist if the church is not engaged. See, we at Love Life, we know that Love Life is not the answer. We believe the church is the answer. And the way that we get churches engaged is through our adoption weeks. And that's what we're gonna go through this week. First, we, it's broken down into four steps. The first step is to hear. We have to know that abortion is the leading cause of death in our city. 10,000 abortions every year happen here in Broward County. And it's the leading cause of death. It's not close, or excuse me, uh, it's not heart disease, cancer, or anything else. It is abortion as the leading cause of death. Uh, step two is uh, prayer and fasting. We don't want to just give you more information. We want to call you to action. So this Wednesday, we're going to pray and fast as a congregation. And then the final piece, or, or the third piece, is the go piece. We're going to go on a prayer walk this Saturday, similar to what you saw in that video. We're going to go and mobilize as a congregation. I want to be clear about Saturday. Saturday is not a protest. It's not a, a picket or a march or anything like that. We meet at Gulfstream Baptist Association, and we're, Pastor Rob's going to be there. He's going to share a word with us. We're going to have a time of worship. We're going to walk a quarter mile to Astra Women's Center for a time of worship and prayer, and then we walk back for a final time of testimony and the final step, which would be to connect. We want to give you an opportunity to stay connected to the ministry beyond the, our prayer walk and the adoption week. So our team is going to be in the lobby we give you all the information for this Saturday, where the prayer walk is from 9 to 11, and we'll give you, get you all the details. We need to get, get you registered, excuse me, my mouth's a little dry. Get you registered for the prayer walk, and like I mentioned, we meet in Plantation at the Gulfstream Baptist Association from 9 to 11. Look forward to seeing you guys and meeting you in the lobby. God bless you guys. Awesome, thanks brother. Well, good morning, church. It is good to be with you. For those of you who don't know me or who are visiting, my name is David Bybee, and I'm the director of Christian Education here at Coral Ridge, and I'm glad to be with you this morning as we continue the sermon series that Pastor Rob began a few weeks ago called Encounters with Jesus. Each week, we've been looking at specific stories of someone's personal encounter with Christ and have been considering the way in which encountering Jesus is transformative in all these encounters. Um, but today I want to tackle this maybe a little bit differently than we have in the past. Before Christ 
came into the world, before the Messiah had come, the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah, and he said that before the day of the Lord would come, that there would arise a voice in the wilderness Someone would come preaching in order that the people would prepare themselves for the Lord's coming, for his arrival. And today I want to consider the words of that voice that announced Jesus' coming into the world, because I believe that it is this one of these passages, this passage in particular, gives us uh, an understanding of what it means to encounter Jesus, what it means that Christ has come into a sinful and fallen world. And so we're going to read Matthew chapter 3 today. Hear now the words of the Lord. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's fur and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance." Do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But when Jesus answered him, he said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Lord, bless the reading of your word this day. In Christ's name, amen. One of the things that I love about series like these, like series like Encounters with Jesus, is because it gives us an opportunity to see the way that Jesus deals with people in a manner that fits them. And of course, this would be so. God has made us in his image. God has stitched us together in our mother's wombs. And he knows each of us, each and every one. And he speaks to us according to what we need to hear. Throughout this series, we've seen Jesus speak in different ways to different people. The way he speaks to Nicodemus is different than the way he would speak to the woman at the well. And this is different than the way that he would address Caiaphas, the high priest. It is different indeed than the way he would speak to Peter. Sometimes when Jesus speaks to us, even the same person, he doesn't always speak in the same manner either. There are times when Peter needs to hear the words, get behind me, Satan, for you are thinking of the things of men rather than meditating on the things of God. And other times, perhaps when Peter needs to be restored after rejecting Jesus three times, Jesus speaks differently here as well. He says, Peter, do you love me? Follow me, speaking a word of restoration. All of us are unique, and those image-bearing differences are God-designed, 
But as sinful people who live in a sinful world, our natural, your sort of unique qualities and our unique experiences will encourage or carry with them particular blind spots or sinful tendencies that we are not often aware of. John Calvin once famously said that the human heart is a factory of idols. Naturally speaking, we aren't interested in submitting to God's ways. We'd much rather make God in our own image. And even for those of us who know Christ, we still are tempted regularly to try and reshape God to fit the kind of expectations that we would have or the preferences that we would have for him. But this is what idolatry is. Idolatry is to live according to a false understanding of God as if it were true. We want to be our own God, so naturally we seek to remake him in our image. And one of the ways that we can unintentionally do this is by gravitating towards biblical narratives or specific examples of Jesus that most fit our temperament and that don't upset our sensibilities. This is because a God who is just like us is a God who will never demand that we do something that is uncomfortable. A God who is just like us will never actually call us to be in any way different because a God just like us is, will seek merely to comfort us where we are. And this is one of the reasons why we particularly need one, one another, why we need to be in community one with another, why we need to read the scriptures and hear the scriptures in community because when we are alone, we are blind to those things which our brothers and sisters often can see very clearly. The reason Protestant churches emphasize preaching through the whole Bible is because that God promises to use the word as it is heard, as it is proclaimed, to actually open our eyes to truths that we don't want to recognize, to convict us of sin that we had yet to see, and to then equip us to go and live different kind of lives. We are those who need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds because ultimately all of us act according to what we believe. We do what we think is right. We act according to what we believe is true. And this is potentially a great danger for us. Because what if what we are thinking or feeling is based upon a lie? What if the decisions we make about how to lead our lives are based on a falsehood, a misconception, a misunderstanding? If we aren't careful to hear the words that Jesus actually speaks in the scriptures, it is possible that the voice we believe is Jesus that we're hearing is nothing other than our own voice simply telling us precisely what we want to hear. And we can assume that this is from Jesus because that voice doesn't make us feel uncomfortable. We have a sense of peace and we can assume that feeling a sense of peace demonstrates that that voice is legitimate. But sometimes demons and false teachers appear as angels of the light. And sometimes, no demons involved at all, we're honest, but we're just honestly wrong. In our passage today, we're shown a side of Jesus and sort of an aspect of the message of the gospel that we often gloss over. I think this is also one of our sort of cultural blind spots where we assume that, that to be loving is first and foremost to be perfectly tolerant. We have a very nice culture in so many ways. We are very interested in making certain that everyone is never made to feel as if something is wrong in their lives. But when, you know, when I open my Bible, I, even as someone who knows Christ and who is familiar with Jesus, I certainly am not looking for passages quite like these. I don't want to encounter words such as these. But in this passage, 
God shows us uh, the way that he determines to announce that salvation has actually come into the world. And it's not the way we might expect. It's through the mouth of a desert prophet, dressed in camel's fur, eating locusts, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think it's interesting that John does not say, rejoice, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but repent. These words from John are significant for a number of reasons, but one thing I want to kind of put a finger on that we, I don't want us to miss is the fact that these are the first words that God had spoken through a prophet to his people in 400 years. Israel once suffered in bondage in Egypt. If you're familiar with the Exodus story, Israel suffered for 400 years in Egypt under slavery before God sends Moses to bring the people out of their captivity. 400 years before this, the prophet Malachi proclaims that a, the great and awesome day of the Lord is coming. The day of salvation is before us. The Lord himself was going to come to Israel and to dwell in its midst. But that would also be a day of great judgment. Before the Lord comes, Malachi says, he would send a prophet like Elijah to warn the people. And God says that this prophet will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. These are difficult words when we're talking about salvation. But salvation is something that actually happens in the real world, on the, re uh, on the ground, in the nitty gritty and darkness of real life, where there are monsters and tyrants and great evil. God is saving the real world not a figment, which means that God is actually dealing with things as they truly are. And Israel had become like Egypt once was. One chapter before this, King Herod had slaughtered the innocent male ch children as Pharaoh had once done, hoping that he could kill the Lord before he would secure his kingdom. Satan, through Herod, seeks to destroy the son of David before he could uh, ultimately secure his victory. But John come, comes announcing that the time waiting under the bondage of evil men is now over. The voice crying out in the wilderness now cries out with a vengeance. And John's preaching should startle us as it startled those in Judea 2,000 years ago. It does not sound like what you would expect from a typical Sunday sermon. You brood of vipers, he says to the Pharisees, who warned you to flee the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, for the ax is laid to the root. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and burned. Who is this Savior who is coming? He says he will baptize you either with the Holy Spirit or with fires of judgment." He comes to gather his wheat, but the chaff is going to be reduced to ashes. Something I missed for many years, but which I think has only become clearer over time as we read the scriptures again and again and get acclimated to the words of God and his revelation. I think the thing that, that has become clear is that God has always brought about redemption of his people through acts of great judgment. Think of how God saves Noah and his family. How does he redeem them? He redeems them in and through the flood. How does God save Lot and his family? He calls them out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but fire does indeed fall upon those cities. God saves Israel from Egypt, but he saves them by way of plagues and through the Red Sea which drowned the Egyptians that pursued them, seeking to kill them. God gives his people the promised land after they cross the River Jordan. But the land could only be theirs if the enemies of God and their idols were devoted to destruction. A pattern emerges throughout the scripture. 
God saves his people precisely by bringing judgment into the world. John comes to Jerusalem like Jonah once comes, came to Nineveh, saying in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. It wasn't a pleasant message for Nineveh. It's not a message you want to hear from a, a prophet. And it certainly wasn't comfortable. But it was an announcement of salvation. What does it mean for us to be redeemed? When we are redeemed, that means that God has actually overturned the real and genuine evil in our lives. Redemption is freedom from slavery. Redemption is ransom from bondage. But to be saved from evil means that evil itself has been revealed and dealt with. To be freed from slavery means that the chains that were gripping you had to be noticed and broken. To be brought out of darkness means that light has actually shone into the darkness to reveal it for what it truly was. There is no redemption apart from genuine and honest judgment. Consider what is reconciliation? What happens when two people are reconciled to another after a relationship has been destroyed? If reconciliation occurs, that means that the sin which destroyed that relationship had been confessed, that the wrongs that have been done which caused that harm have actually been made right, and then relationship is restored. There is no reconciliation between parties without there also being honest and genuine judgment. There is no salvation for us to find in this world except from God, the one true and living God. But to stand before God is to stand before the judge. And every time God draws near is a time when judgment falls. Because when God draws near, that means that we are standing in the presence of holiness. And holiness shows evil for what it is. Truth shows lies to be false. If we have been cleansed from sin, this means that our sin must first be named and acknowledged for God. John is here announcing to the people that God is about to redeem them. But the only way to receive that redemption is to repent when you meet him. John is clear, you can indeed be saved from the wrath to come. But the only way to be saved is to confront the truth. This is why I believe John is able to honestly introduce Jesus' ministry in this way, with this kind of language, this language of judgment, because it is the truth, Jesus says, that actually sets us free. And God himself, living truth, holiness incarnate, was coming. Salvation was coming. But that means then that judgment was coming as well. What does this mean for us? I think it means a few things, but I think principally, this means that we can only meet God as God actually is. There is no other God for us to meet. There is no other Lord from whom we might find forgiveness. And there is no other savior that God has given to us by which we may be saved. God is not interested in a version of us that we present before the public. God isn't interested in seeing us covered in fig leaves of our own creation, pretending that we are not guilty. God is not interested in comforting us so that we would continue to commit the sins that have so easily and continually entangled us. God in Christ Jesus is seeking to redeem us, the real us, out of our particular unique sin and darkness, out of the actual experiences of our real lives on the ground. God isn't merely seeking to save us from our respectable sins, 
but from the ones that we are most terrified of anyone ever hearing about. And in order to experience this, I believe it is as a counselor friend of mine, David Field, says, the only place that you can truly meet God is in the center of the garden, naked and ashamed. Because that is the only place where God can be met in the real world, in reality, where we acknowledge the truth of who we have become in light of who God is himself. But when we meet God in this way, not seeking to defend ourselves, not seeking to make ourselves to be something that we are not, but vulnerably and honestly opening ourselves to God with his true scrutiny. This is the very place where salvation emerges. This is the place where mercy blossoms in all of our lives because that's the place from which God begins to restore and to redeem us. When we face God as we actually are, finding ourselves not capable and strong, but dead in our sins and unable to pick ourselves up, we do find ourselves before the righteous judge. But but then is when we can meet him as our savior. John does come preaching judgment telling the people they must prepare for the coming of Christ into this world. But he does so as a prophet dressed in camel's fur. Why does this matter? Prophets don't always come uh, to just speak their prophecy. Sometimes they also act their prophecy out. Why is John dressed in camel's fur and eating locusts? I believe this is actually a signal of the hope that we can have, even in the midst of these difficult words. I'm grateful for Pastor Jeff Myers for pointing this out. John is eating locusts in the first case because locusts are a plague that God sends in judgment. And John is warning that judgment indeed is coming, but he's wearing camel's fur. And the word camel appears in one particular chapter in the Bible more than any other. That's in Genesis 21. In Genesis 21, we are told a story of Abraham sending a servant with an enormous number of camels in order that the servant could go and find a bride that was fit for his promised son. So that the servant could go find a bride and secure a bride right, that would be fit for Isaac, the miracle child, the one that would carry along the faithful line. And in Matthew 3, we see something similar. The father is seeking a bride that is suitable for his son, and he sends a servant covered in camel's fur to prepare the way and to call them out that they would know he was coming for them and that they must respond in humility. This is why to encounter Jesus is to encounter judgment, because to encounter Jesus is to encounter the Lord who is zealous for his bride. Adam failed to protect Eve in the garden because he refused to actually fight against evil in his midst. He refused to stomp the serpent who came to deceive his bride. And his failure has plunged humanity into the misery of sin. But Christ does not share in Adam's weakness. Christ comes into the world in order that the evil of this world and that all that assaults his bride would be overturned. Jesus comes in order that those of us, evil men and women, guilty men and women, might become clean, restored, new creations who can live new lives that we did not know before. But this coming of Christ into the world is the announcement of both salvation and judgment. But the Lord does not leave us as we were. In his body on the cross, Jesus has condemned us indeed and our sin. He puts us to death in his own death. He kills us and our wickedness as he dies on the cross. But he does not merely forgive us. He makes us new. At the baptism of Jesus, God proclaims to the whole world, this is my son. 
the only son. He alone is the savior of all. And all of us who have been baptized in to Christ Jesus have also now been marked as God's children in Christ. To be baptized, Paul says, is to be united to Christ's death. To be baptized is to die to yourself and to the old way, right? Noah passes through the waters of the flood. The old world is gone. They pass through the, re- the waters of the Red Sea and the old life in Egypt is gone. In our baptisms, God is summoning us into a new world, into a new life, into the life of the world to come that will actually persist forever. But we therefore must die to the ways of this world. If we cling to our sin and the lies of this world, we will not receive life. But if we receive Christ in humility, not making excuses for our sin, but acknowledging them truly, he makes us brand new. Today we come to the Lord's table. At the Lord's table, God invites us to come and to meet him again, to meet him as we truly are. At the table, we do see the great cost of our sin. In order for us to be redeemed, Christ had to die that we might live. But at the table, through the sacrament, God gives us the promise that we can bank on, that Christ did actually give himself for you and in your place so that your sins which were like scarlet, your sins which did indeed require judgment in this world, judgment which has been poured upon Christ, that those sins have been cleansed and eternally so. We can come not because we are good enough and have earned it. We come because Christ has cleansed us, his bride, and has given us all that we could ever need. And we can know today and every day with certainty that all who call upon the name of Jesus in humility will never be turned away. We've heard difficult words from the scriptures today. We have. And it's important that we hear them. It's important we hear the things we don't like to hear because it is in these ways that God is seeking to wake us up. Today, I say to you, if you have heard the voice of God Do not harden your hearts today. Do not harden your hearts to the Lord Jesus who comes with truth and with salvation. Call out to him. Receive him indeed. And you will be made new. Come, let us taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. God, our Father, We thank you that you are a God who is love. And as the God who is love, Lord, you actually seek goodness, holiness, justice, and righteousness in this world. Because you are a God of love, the world as it is is being transformed. Lives are being restored. So God, I pray that today, especially as we come to the table, that you would bless us, your people, that you would remind us of the great redemption that you have achieved for us in Christ. Because his blood has been shed, there is an eternal redemption, and we have been invited to it. So Lord, today, bless this, your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David, and thank you for those uh, great words of salvation and a reminder of how God does indeed save us through Christ. You know, in Old Testament worship, in the early, uh, the the Hebrew church, there were a number of sacrifices, and there was a sacrifice called the fellowship offering. It was always offered at the end of the service, and what was unique about that particular offering was, was the only offering in which part of the animal was actually eaten by the worshiper. So the animal was killed, it was cut up, 
A part of it was put on the altar and burned. That was like that was God's part. A part of it was cooked and eaten by the, the priests, and a part of it was cooked and eaten by the worshiper. And what do you think that signified? Well, just think about it. Who do you eat with? You only eat with people with whom you are at peace. You don't eat with your enemies, okay? You don't eat with those who, who you're at war with, but you eat with those with whom you are at peace. And that was really one of the wonderful pictures of the Lord's table. God himself is offering to eat with you. Uh, he invites you to come to this table through his perfect son, Jesus Christ, and dine with him. Now, how do you come to this table? Is this table for anyone? No, God sets the terms. It's only for people with whom he is at peace through his son, Jesus. And the way that happens is, as we've heard preached, it's by uh, coming to God as you are, uh, confessing your sins to him, and receiving the grace and forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this table is not a table of our particular church. It's the Lord's table, and it's for all of you who profess faith in Christ and who have made that profession of faith public by uh, baptism and membership in this body or some other uh, Bible-believing church. So if that's true of you, I want to invite you to partake of communion today and fellowship with the living God. Um, as you know, we're going to be taking communion with these little uh, single service. If you don't have one, raise your hand so the ushers can serve you. We've got some up here in the front. And so we'll all be ready to, to uh, eat together. Ushers here in the front, we have some folks who need them. Let's go ahead and take out the, the bread portion and just hold it in your hand. A few more over here. And let's pray together. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus Christ, for your perfect life of obedience, obedience credited to our account. We praise you for your painful and shameful death, the death that we deserve to die. We praise you for your glorious resurrection, which guaranteed our resurrection and the new life. We praise you for your ascension into heaven, that you're ruling and reigning over all things. And we praise you for the promise of your glorious return. We look forward to that day when you come and set all things right. O oh Lord Jesus, commune with your people. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Let's take your cup and let's open this and prepare to drink. After supper, our Savior took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Let's pray again. How amazing it is, Lord Jesus, to think that we commune with you, that sinful creatures that we are, that you lift us up into the heavenly places and we enjoy all the blessings that you've secured for us. We give you thanks for your grace. We give you thanks for your great salvation. And we pray that you would encourage your people through this meal. Uh, may we leave this place knowing that we have fellowshiped with the living God and with his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. for worshiping with us at Coral Ridge. We are a gospel-centered church that equips culture-shaping Christians. For more information on the church, our studies, and upcoming events and live streams, visit crpc.org or download the Coral Ridge app available now in the App Store. To give to the ministry here at Coral Ridge, visit crpc.org give. 
You can also mail checks to the address below. From wherever you're watching, thank you for worshiping with us this morning.